Hi there, welcome again to Pink Sofa Conversation. And in this instance, I'm here with Eloisa Diaz. How are you, Elo? Hi, how are you, Alicia? Thank you for having me on this podcast. Nah. Thank you so much for joining us. Eloisa and I, we went to the same school. We are both at some t at some point in our life, we ended up in Marbella in the south of Spain. And then we went to the German school. And that's how we actually met. And since then, I don't know how old we were. How old were we when we met first? Early six, seven, like five yeah. years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I always knew Ella would be doing something incredible. She was one of the smartest in the class. And she always was, she was always reading, always writing, very, you know, very engaged in what has, was happening in the world. And so it's actually not a surprise to me that she's a writer and a novelist. And that's why she's here. So Ella, tell us, how did you end up writing and what's your background? Uh, my background study-wise is in the law, but from, a, as you say, probably since I was an insufferable child, uh, I, I already, from a very early age on, I engaged in writing and reading and exploring the world through that. Uh, so it came quite naturally to me to uh, continue uh, on that path, and that is how my novel was born, actually. Fantastic. But is this your first novel? But you've been writing always, but is this the first time that you get something published? Yes, it is the first time uh, that I publish and it is actually also my first novel. So I'm very lucky that way that um, okay. that the first novel I write is um, the one that gets published. That's amazing. So give us a little bit of an insight of, of course, what you can. Don't spoil your own <laughs> masterpiece. What, what takes place? What happens in that novel? Uh, well, the novel is a literary uh, noir thriller, so it has parts that would appeal to a detective novel reader. And then it also goes into uh, questions of uh, societal change, community, and uh, an examination of Argentina's country and history. Uh, so it is set uh, in Argentina in two time frames. Uh, one is 2001, when the um, Cacerolazo, when the revolution uh, started and ended, actually, with the ousting of the president then through uh, citizen action. And the other is in 81, where we meet the same cast of characters when they're younger. And, um, and at that time, Argentina was living through a dictatorship and a dirty war. So the specter and the shadow of that uh, you know, we as citizens don't do something, uh, what will come out of it. Uh, that always seemed relevant to me and that's why I picked those two to balance one and the other in the process. I hope that's I didn't... That's lovely. No, that's lovely. That That's almost like this, you know, 10 year challenge that was everywhere where you would see a picture of you today and then 10 years ago. So Eloisa, for those that don't know you, what's your connection to Argentina? Why did you choose Argentina? Uh, both my parents, I am Spanish. Uh, both my parents are Argentinian immigrants in Spain. Yeah. And it was always, as a child, it was always this magical land that obviously my grandmother would talk about and my parents would talk about uh, with a mixture, like all immigrants, I yeah. guess mixture of uh, bitterness and nostalgia and then I got to experience it myself so I thought it would be fitting because the cycles of history so like as history repeats itself apparently in Argentina it does that at an incredible pace so it <laughs> in one lifetime or in a collection of, of lifetimes to see that evolution happen and and describe that and delve into that. Yeah. And you and I were speaking a little bit before and you were saying that what makes actually this uh, thriller or novel also so relevant is that you're talking about a movement, a human movement, no? when society turns around and says the people may be enough or we need a change. How do you think that translates with today's situation? Um, I mean, the fact of, of the effectiveness and the reach of citizen action has been, uh, I think, around since the Greeks who feared their own population. No? There's always this yeah. kind of dichotomy between we need the population and we also fear it. Uh, and we fear that they realize their power. And so many social movements we've seen through the ages have been, um, 
have been installed and pushed and so much legislation has been passed because of uh, that social push. And I think it's always interesting to be awake to that. No, I mean, the millennials would say woke, uh, but to be awake <laughs> to that uh, power that we actually have and to exercise that power within the reach of legality, I'm not saying otherwise, uh, but that we... You're a lawyer after all. <laughs> I never recommend anything outside of the bounds of the law. Uh, but no, when we realize that banging, like in Argentina, like banging pots and pans that they threw down a government, it makes you ask, um, it definitely makes me ask myself about moments where we as societies have been more complacent and, yeah. uh, and have um, followed more than question, no? I think it's always important to question everything. Going back to the insufferable child, you know, it's always yeah. important to ask all the questions all the time. Yeah. So for me, uh, as a person that I love to observe society and see how things evolve, and I have my very specific way of seeing the world and my beliefs and yeah, ethics or whatever. Do you think that from this situation that we're now with the you know, forbidden word coronavirus. Do you think we will have learned something or will it be almost like this circle of going back and back and back that you were saying before? Um, that's a really tough question. Uh, I guess I, I, I ponder between two states, one of, of severe skepticism of uh, the comfortableness probably of modern life that has led us to to not risk so much because we are in that comfort or fake comfort as we're seeing now yeah. or false sense of certitude, for example. Uh, but I guess the, the, the little cynic in me can also be pushed aside for the idea of... Um, uh, I've seen so many examples even within my building of our neighbors who we never had talked and running groceries for each other and checking into checking in with people that I hadn't reached out to in a whole while and how that tissue of humanity can be built or rebuilt in different ways that we were not used to or that we had forgotten more than yeah I was listening to this uh, to this actually podcast and they were saying that we're going to be having so many stories coming from coronavirus in literature and filming but not so much the big stories but the little micro stories and maybe something as you were sharing right now that you will make a collective list with your neighbors and how you know this new connection of dynamics will create something afterwards that you know from an artistical point of view we will loop in more into those micro dynamics um, what are you I mean are you taking some inspiration from this whole thing for your next piece or are you saying, okay, this, this is with thrillers and my next piece, I want something a little bit more happier? <laughs> hope to, well, <laughs> I hope to, for this situation to pass and never to talk about the year 2020 again. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, obviously, I think that, uh, that there must be some observation uh, that will be helpful. I don't know if that will percolate in my art. I think not immediately. Uh, I know that you also yourself uh, make and create and I don't know if we share this experience but for me it takes a whole while from the moment that I live something or that I go through an experience and the moment where it really percolates and I'm ready to, to well for me in, in words but to, to yeah. make something out of it not to first have to have it marinated let's say and digested before I can make something out of it so if the coronavirus novel happens, indeed, it will be in a, in a long time. Uh, okay, yeah, no, that makes absolute sense that you need to digest your experiences in order to make them yourself and then create something. So, Elo, is it allowed? Can you tell us with whom you're, with which company or editorial you're going to be having your book published? Or is yes. this a secret? No, no, no. It is uh, less and less secrets now as, uh, as the weeks come. In the UK, it's coming out with uh, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, which is an imprint of Orion. Uh, in French, it is coming out with Le Masque. Uh, in German, it's coming out with uh, Hoffmann und Kampe. Okay. In Italian, I'm not done. Uh, in Italian, it's coming <laughs> out with uh, PM Mondadori. And in Spanish, it's coming out with uh, Seis Barral and Planeta Libros. Okay. Uh, so we have a lot of 
different versions of the book to look forward to. Actually. It's amazing, right, that you get everything, like, that it's such a good novel, I guess, I haven't read it, that you automatically get the contract to be translated into five languages. That's not something very common, or is it common? It is not common at all. I feel like I have yeah. won the lottery uh, of books and publishing, definitely, yeah. becoming a, a professional writer. Uh, I also have worked my ass off. Can I say work my ass off? In... You can say work my beep off. Work my beep off. So I guess it, it is satisfying to see the result of a lot of years work in something. But indeed, I I count myself to be very lucky that um, that a first novel would have that success already from the get-go. No? Fantastic. So you say years working. So. What has been your creative process like? How long have you been working on this? I have been working on I started it actually um, when I was doing my master's at Columbia in creative writing. Uh, we had to submit a number of pages and stories yeah. and that is where, where at least the character and the, the seed definitely of the story were born. And then I, I finished the master's, I had the first hundred pages maybe and then well then life happened and so uh i had to put it aside and bring it back again start not from scratch but definitely uh from the person that i was becoming obviously the novel was becoming quite different and uh so yes i think that almost seven years now in the making and uh, oh, wow. all written by hand also so uh no <laughs> yes <laughs> So the, the, the transcribing it to word document had to be quite interesting. Yes, I it is. Uh, I take it as a first uh, editing, you know. Okay. The, since I'm reading it out loud to myself and typing it already at that moment, I'm like, hmm, no, yeah, this paragraph now. So um, yeah. So yeah. But uh, that's amazing. And in those seven years, you've lived in many places. You've been in the U.S. Then you've been in Spain. You've moved around. So I'm sure that. All these experiences have also been, or are, in an indirect way, also part of your story and all your of your book. Yes, obviously, I think that I've taken from. Um, I couldn't say that any particular character is any particular person, uh, but of course, there's many reflections and and as you were saying about your beliefs and your philosophy and what you would want the book to say, you know, that come out of obviously the experience that I've been accumulating from the start and so. You know. Yeah. And uh, so, Elo, what is next after after this? Are you already getting ready on your next non uh, <laughs> non COVID uh, novel, or what's coming after? What's next? Uh, um, I am giving myself uh, permission right now to write into the void without any preconceived idea, and that has already become its own sort of meditation. You know, yeah. Wake up for so long with one project in mind and suddenly you don't have that project, um, it can be uh, tempting, I think, to fall immediately into the next novel that you're doing. Uh, so I'm allowing myself to, uh, instead of output, to have lots of input now. You know, lots of art, lots of uh, having things sink in, experiences sink in, and see what might spark my interest for the next seven years. I, I hope less, but... Um, uh, uh, but yeah, for now we're launching this, uh, I think in the beginning of 2021, and so now we're in the process of, of launching it. And that will be That's amazing. And Elo, to finish up, so how do you see the world evolving in the sense of consuming books? Because we were talking about audiobooks and not people not buying, or yes, maybe buying again all these print copies. What's your take on that? Um, I have, to, I mean, in the last couple, more than a couple of years, uh, the podcast, audiobook, Kindle uh, industry has risen to any roof than, than one might have imagined, possibly, you know, even the creator of the Kindle. Um, <laughs> uh, I am um, I'm a Luddite in that way. I like books. I like, uh, I like the physical experience, even though I do both. And I think that, that yes, the world is going towards, and especially in times like these, uh, towards using the, the tools of technology, towards feeling closer, but that doesn't eliminate at all. And it even 
adds value to the actual, you know, we were saying like the getting a postcard now takes on a an whole other value because you know that that person actually went through the effort and didn't tag you on an Instagram story or something. No? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, not- I think the tactile ingredient that books have, it will always remain, at least for those that are romantics like you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am a romantic in that sense. Um, and I do have my favorite books that I have to have within reach and touch. And it's the copy that I remember that has my notes. And, and that is quite an important part for me. So I think that both worlds will find a way to coexist and complement each other I yeah. think their weaknesses and strengths Ella thank you so much so you said you won the lottery with your first book so maybe you won double lottery and then it ends up being a movie or something hopefully I, mean, I wouldn't say no to a beautiful TV show you know uh, <laughs> <laughs> Netflix please contact her <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 but yes of course it would be like a, it's whole uh, roller coaster no to see it yeah. like to life and and that but uh, for now um, I think that this uh, this has been good this has been good so uh, happy to hear hello thank you so much and we will put all your contact uh, on the video so people can follow you and ensure that they're updated on on the book because you haven't given us a title it's a secret no 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 it's called repentance got it fantastic <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thank uh, you, Elo. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it was a pleasure as always. Huh? Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks.